Well, welcome everybody. Um, I, I, if I feel a little bit silly speaking like I'm talking to an entire church when there's a small gathering of us, um, but uh, the, part of the reason for that is I want to record these sessions uh, so that others can watch later uh, if they've missed the course uh, or missed the day. So um, please put up with me being in slightly preachy mode, um, but what there will be, I promise, is an opportunity to ask some questions later. Um, but I'm going to speak for a little while. Uh, about this important topic of God and Jesus. I'm going to be asking us to think about how do we know what we think we know about God? Where have those ideas come from? And crucially, what does Jesus have to tell us about God and who God is? Yeah? So does that sound interesting? Reasonably? Yeah? I've got to see if we keep Madder awake on the front row. Yeah, that, that'll be my test, yeah? So, so let's, let's go. And the first thing to say is that what we think we know about God has a very, very long history. I'm going to put up this slide, which gives you um, just a sense of how human society has evolved over the centuries. And you can see that uh, the, the earliest time we can say with any certainty that human beings started to think about themselves in relation to the world and perhaps in, the, in relation to God goes right back to 10,000 years ago and before. There's a famous uh, archaeological site in Turkey called Gobekli Tepe, uh, Tepe uh, for example, which shows that human beings 10,000 years ago were thinking about gods and, and thinking about what was above them and around them and what, what, what forces might be in control of their lives. This is a very old tradition to, to think about God. In fact, you could even imagine um, a, a cave uh, woman sitting in the entrance to her cave and you can imagine that perhaps she had a little tree a little I don't know apple tree growing outside her cave and, and that perhaps as the years rolled by she noticed that when there was plenty of rain and just the right amount of sun her apple tree would produce beautiful apples but in the years when it was dry and there was no sun and, and, and there was a drought, the apple tree didn't produce fruit. And you can imagine, can't you, such a, such a cave woman saying to herself, well, I wonder why this is. Maybe there are forces, uh, like big people up in the sky who are sending down the rain and sending the right amount of sun. And you can imagine this cave woman starting to, to think about how she could make the, the beings up in the sky do the right thing, send the right amount of rain, send the right amount of sun. You can imagine it, can't you? That's what she'd want, because she'd want her apples to grow. And so she'd think about, oh, maybe if I, maybe if I sacrifice, if I give a little of an apple back to the gods, how, how would I do that? Oh, maybe I'll burn it. And then, and then the smoke from the apple will rise up to, to these beings in the sky and they will be pleased by the smell of the apple and maybe they will then send more rain to grow more apples, yeah? And you can imagine that from very simple ideas like that came all of the notions of sacrifice which were such a big part of ancient religions, weren't they? You know, in, Jewish, in the Jewish religion, in the time of Jesus, people were sacrificing entire animals on the altar. They were sacrificing pigeons and doves for small sins, but they were sacrificing sheep and even cattle for, for the times when they thought they'd been really bad. Yeah? They were trying to please God by, by giving him a sacrifice. And that takes us to this chart, which just plots the timeline of the Old Testament, because of course the God that we're talking about is the Christian God. And the Christian God is rooted in the Jewish tradition and the Jewish understandings of God that we see in the Old Testament. And as you can see, that's quite a, 
uh, uh, quite a complex story. If you, if you map it out, and I haven't got time to take you through it today, but it's got some key features along the way. You start with this mythical story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And then you move through important uh, shared stories that other cultures have, like Noah and the Ark. And, and then you move into the time of the Exodus, when Moses led the, the people out of Egypt. And, and then you've got the entrance into what was known as Canaan and then became Israel and Judea. And then you've got a monarchy period. Then you've got uh, a time after the monarchy's fall uh, when there is an exile, it says over here somewhere, Babylonian exile. Yeah. And then finally, we reach the end of the Old Testament, just at the point, more or less, where Jesus arrives. So all of this history feeds in to what the Jewish people believed God was like. And they had lots and lots of different names for God. Here's just a, a sample of some of those names. El Shaddai, which means Lord God Almighty or, or Great High God of the Mountain. Yeah, It, it, it can also mean, I'm told... It, depending on, on exactly how you translate it, God who is the many-breasted one, suggesting a, that God has many breasts to, in order to feed God's children. Yeah, That's a rather lovely, lovely metaphor, isn't it? But there's the Most High God, there's Adonai, there's Yahweh, which, which over the centuries became Jehovah. Uh, the word changed to become Jehovah. And then you've got Jehovah Nisi, the Lord who is my banner, the Lord who is my shepherd, Jehovah Ra. You can read them for yourself. These are all ways of seeking to understand what God is like, what qualities are there in God. And so the people of God are testifying when they say, uh, for example, Jehovah Ra, the Lord is my shepherd, they're saying, I know that God is with me. And I know that when life has been difficult, I have felt God walking alongside me and leading me like a shepherd would lead their sheep. Yeah? The Lord will provide Jehovah Jireh. Is, is presumably from you know, those people who've, who've felt God providing for them at times of crisis or, or need. Yeah? So these are, this is language used and evolved over centuries to try to understand what God is like. But what is God like for us? is the question I want to ask. And this is where I'm going to hopefully get you thinking a little bit. I'm going to put up here six modern images of God that we carry around in our heads, some people. I can see Tom smiling there. You're recognising some of them, perhaps. Uh, um, so I'll just, let's just walk through them one by one. Excuse me. And see if they have some resonance for you. So, so up here on the top, you've got God who is the loving father. Yeah, that's a, that's a common understanding of God, isn't it? There you, you see that lovely picture of a, a quite youthful looking God. You know, he's that's obviously God as expressed through Jesus, you know, standing lovingly over the world. It's um, reminiscent of the lovely image we have on our nave altar um, that you may have seen, particularly if you've come on a, on a Thursday. Uh, you might want to look it out afterwards, which is a, an image of God holding the whole world in his hands. Uh, hands up who remembers that song from, from the 1960s. Yes, that's it. Yeah. I know you weren't alive in the 1960s, Millie. It's all right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, you know, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. Yeah. Wonderful. It's a lovely image of God as a kind of loving father. Though it doesn't say everything about God, 
It doesn't, for example, tackle that, that idea that God may have many breasts. Yeah? It wouldn't make him a father, would it? It would make him more of a mother, which is a lovely thought. That we tend to think of God in male terms, not least because the Old Testament was mainly written by men, it has to be said. Yeah? It was a very male-dominated um, society. Yeah? But the Bible does tell us that God created men and women in the image of God. So whether we are male or female, we are both made in the image of God, which suggests a feminine side to God, doesn't it? Yeah. I sometimes think as we use our standard liturgy here at the altar, you know, we say Almighty Father, or yeah, we say Father God, or our Father who art in heaven, that perhaps we overplay the, the fatherliness of God and sometimes forget the motherliness of God as well. That might be a theme that I'll talk about next week on Mothering Sunday. We shall see. All right. So, loving father, that's one image. The next one, in the middle, at the top. God who is love. That's a, there's a phrase from one of the letters of John in the New Testament. And it just says very simply, God is love. And those who live in love live in God. And God lives in them. It's rather beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. John almost seems to be saying that that's all God is. Yeah? Just God is defined as love. Yeah. But we should be careful to pigeonhole God into just one word and one phrase. Yeah. Because there's another ang angle to God, which we can see here, which is the picture of an angry and wrathful God. Yeah? Love can be angry. Love can be wrathful, can't it? I'm sure Madder and Sarah know what it's like to have angry or wrathful parents sometimes. When we can, not that they would ever do anything naughty or silly or, or ever get shouted at. I know because they're perfect, aren't you? Yeah? Yes, Father, yes. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anger comes with anger comes with 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 love, doesn't it? If you love someone and you see them doing something destructive to themselves or to others, you you, you can feel anger, real anger. What about this one over here? The slot machine god. <coughs> this is a very contemporary notion. It's the notion that God is like some sort of heavenly vending machine. And that if I just say the right prayers with the right words and the right intensity, then God will give me what I've asked for. Yeah? Be like, be like if I, as long as I select the right coin and put it exactly in for the right amount, then I'll get the right can of Coke out of the vending machine. Well, it, you know, some people treat God a bit like that. They say, if I, just, if I just believe, then God will give me a Rolls Royce. He will just, he will just give me a, a, my own private yacht and a, and, a, and a desert island to live on. Yeah, please, please, God. You know? But God isn't a slot machine God, is he? When we ask for things, we're told to ask in, in the name of Jesus. And that's a phrase that doesn't have the resonance that it used to have. To people at Jesus' time, when you do something in the name of someone else, it means that you do it in their way, in their style, according to their uh, understandings, according to their preferences. Yeah? So if I pray in the name of Jesus, um, let's see, take, a, take a silly example. Yeah? If I pray in the name of Jesus that the ceiling of this church might fly off, yeah? it's not going to happen, is it? Because I don't believe that that's what Jesus wants for the, for the roof to fly off. Yeah? That's, not, that's not within his will. When we pray in the name of someone, we think about what it is they would want in this situation. We attempt to harmonize 
our will to theirs and make our prayers in that spirit. Yeah? So it's not a slot machine God that we serve. That can link to this idea of a sort of Santa Claus God as well. Yeah, people confuse God and Santa Claus sometimes. Yeah, because Santa Claus is this uh, figure who rewards the good and punishes the evil, don't they? Are you naughty or nice? Yeah? Are you, madder? you can answer me this, are you going to be on Santa's naughty list or his nice list when it comes to Christmas? You're going to be on the nice list, are you? Yeah, yeah, okay. We shall see. Yeah, yeah, I, I, we shall see. We shall consult with the wider family and decide which one we shall put you on. Yeah? Mm. You know, but, but it's, a fair, it's a very sort of simple um, concept, isn't it, with Santa? He's either going to give you gifts or he's going to give you a piece of coal if you're either naughty or nice. Yeah? Again, a very simplistic idea that people sometimes think of for God as well. Actually, God's love for us is such that he doesn't want to give us anything bad. Certainly doesn't want to place us on a naughty list. Jesus said, if, you're, if your son asks for a, a fish, would you give him a serpent? <laughs> if your son asks for a loaf of bread, would you give him a stone? No, no. God wants to give us what our hearts desire when they are are linked up with his desire yeah and then finally and this is perhaps my favorite and, I, and I've used a quote from from one of our hymns father lord of all creation ground of being life and love height and depth beyond description only life in you can prove. The, the, the main phrase that I love there is the ground of being. That God is the ground on which we stand. Without God, there can be nothing. He's the ground on which we stand physically because God brings everything into being. But he's also the ground on which we stand spiritually. Yeah? He gives us a firm foundation on which to stand. He is the ground of our being. And that's, I find that really helpful because it's so easy to think of God up there all the time, isn't it? Up in heaven, you know, looking down on us. A bit like that picture of, of Jesus looking down on the earth. If you reverse it and talk about God as the ground of our being, I, I find that a really beautiful metaphor. Yeah? God is the, the rock on which we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. I'll leave you to ponder that one. So I hope you've seen through those slides that human beings have a vast number of different ways of thinking about God. But what does scripture say? Well, here's a few choice quotes that I particularly like. From the first chapter of John, no man... We could read it as no person has yet seen God. We can't see God. We can only sense God. We can only explore God. We can only search God out. We can't actually just walk up and shake his hand. Hmm? In the book of Job... Um, which is a which is a, a, a wonderful story. Uh, I'll tell you very quickly. Um, Job was a wealthy, successful man, and um, God was one day looking down from heaven and saying, "Oh, what a splendid fellow he is! Look how he worships me!" 
Yeah, and, everything, and everything's going well in his life. Oh, splendid fellow. And according to this story, it's a myth, obviously. It's a, it's a kind of a fairy story. But according to this story, Satan comes wandering by. <laughs> and God says to Satan, oh, look, look at, my, look at my servant Job. What a wonderful man he is. And, and Satan says, well, I don't think he'd be quite so, quite so worshipy. If, you, if he didn't have all that lovely property and that lovely house and that lovely wife and all those lovely children, he'd hate you then, wouldn't he? And God says, no, 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 no. Sure, 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 he would be fine. Well, Satan says, well, let me take it all away from him then and we'll see what happens. So they have a little bet. They have a wager, God and Satan, in this mythological story. And, and Satan takes away Job's possessions and kills his wife and his children and he gives him a disease you know so that his body is wasting away with leprosy and much of the rest of Job is the story of Job trying to get his head round what is God allowed to have to be done to him and as part of the arguments that go to and fro between Job and his friends and then ultimately towards the end of the book Job and God God says, can you discover the depths of God? Can you discover the limits of the Almighty? In other words, your tiny little brain is not capable of comprehending the limits, the depths, the heights of God. That's, that's kind of... Makes you feel a bit humble, doesn't it, to think like that? There was a philosopher called Schumacher who, who said, we can think of life in terms of orders of life. We have inanimate life, rocks and so forth. A rock doesn't know anything about what's happening to itself, does it? Doesn't know if it's being walked on or eroded. <laughs> But from that rock comes soil and then eventually plants. Now plants, plants do have a little bit of awareness of what's going on because they react to things. They react to the, to the sun shining. They, they grow, don't they? Or they react to not being enough rain. We're back to our apple tree and our cave woman, aren't we? Yeah? But, but they have some awareness of things that are greater than them. If, if a dog walks through the grass and squashes the grass, the grass has to respond to that. It doesn't understand what a dog is. It doesn't understand that it's just been trodden on. <laughs> it can't conceive of what a dog is. And now look at the dog. When a dog looks at a human being, do you think the dog understands what it is to be human? Can the dog really look inside my mind or your mind and know what I'm thinking? No. The dog only responds to whether I'm nice to it or whether I kick it. Yeah? Not that I ever would, you understand. Yeah? Yeah? So we've worked up through the layers, haven't we? From soil to plants to animals to human beings. And we've realised that at each level below, the level below has no conception of what, of what we're truly like. Now think above human beings. What's above human beings? God. You and I are like dogs to a human or plants to a dog. We can never understand the mind of God. And yet God reveals himself to us. God allows us to see something of what God is like. But we see, as St. Paul says, through a glass, darkly. Remember, in the time that Paul was writing, glass was, was opaque. It wasn't, we didn't have pure, clear glass like our modern glass. Glass in those days was, was rather more like the stained glass that you see around the church. You couldn't see through it you, but you could you could if somebody was to you know if I dropped madder on a string in uh, down behind that window outside yeah if we put a rope on her and made her swing backwards and forwards 
yeah, in front of the window, and we were looking through. We'd see matter's, matter's shape, wouldn't we? Yeah? We wouldn't know that it was matter. We wouldn't even know if it was a girl or a boy or a man. or a, We'd just see a shape through the glass, darkly. And that's what St. Paul, I think, is saying when he says, we see God through a glass darkly. So how then can we know God? We primitive creatures with our tiny brains. How can we know God? Well, the Bible wants us to understand that it is Jesus who shows us what God is truly like. If we want to know what God is like, we look to Jesus. And I want you to understand that Jesus was judged by those around him, his followers, those who really got to know him, who'd lived with him for three years, maybe more, as being so in tune with God, so connected to this mystery of God, so alive to God, that his followers started calling him God's son, or even God himself. That was how they perceived him. And then later writers, who you'll see on this side of the screen, we've got Paul saying, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. That's what I've just been, we've been talking about, isn't it? Godliness is a, a mystery. God is a mystery. By common confession, meaning everybody agrees, God is a mystery who was revealed in the flesh. Because Jesus revealed him in his flesh. And he was vindicated by the Spirit. The Spirit appeared during Jesus' ministry, didn't he, when he was baptised and at other key points like on, on the Mount of Transfiguration, proving, if you like, vindicating that Jesus' understanding of God should be listened to. Uh, as as uh, the Spirit is said to have said on Jesus' baptism, no, Jesus of the Transfiguration, this is my son, listen to him. He was seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and then taken up in glory. Paul is saying to Timothy, if you want to know what God is like, look to Jesus. He then goes on to his letter to the Colossians. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. God is invisible, but Jesus offers us an image of him. If we want to know what God is like, look to Jesus. And then Jesus himself is quoted by John in chapter 10, when he says, I and the Father are one. We are so united to each other that you could call us one. What does this mean? Well, it, it means that when we look to Jesus... We see what God is like. We see what God, how God would respond to the situations that life throws at us. We see that God is loving and healing. That's what Jesus did, wasn't he? He went about healing and offering compassion like he did to the woman caught in adultery that everyone wanted to stone Jesus gave her compassion and said, I'm not going to condemn you. Just, just go and don't sin anymore. Yeah. He was giving. He gave of himself completely. Yeah. So it's about God. It's about that loving compassion that Jesus reveals. So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us through Jesus. We've come to know that God is love. And whoever abides in love, abides in God. 
And God abides, lives, that means, in him. But, <laughs> also, let's not forget that there is, a, there is something in Jesus that tells us that God can sometimes be a bit angry or perhaps just passionately concerned about human sinfulness. Uh, this line at the bottom of the screen says, you know, when people ask that question, what would Jesus do? Never, never forget that chasing sinners out of a temple with a whip in your hand is not out of the question. It's one of the things Jesus did, yeah? <laughs> yeah, there's a danger, isn't there, that we make Jesus too soft and too cuddly and too, uh, you know, we, we focus on that sense of love and forgiveness and, and uh, compassion and we forget that there are consequences to acting in sinful ways as well. And Jesus is concerned by that, perhaps even made angry by it when he sees human beings acting sinfully to each other. So if Jesus reveals God to us, why did he have to die? This is a vital question within Christianity. Jesus' death is known as the atonement, which, as you see, breaks down quite literally into at one meant. It's the only word in uh, classical theology that comes from the English. Most other theological words, like the word theology itself, comes from Greek uh, or from Latin. But the English language has contributed this one word to worldwide theology. It's at one -ment, pronounced atonement. Jesus helps us to become one with God. How is the question? And this is a question that has torn Christians apart for generations. I've put up there the four main atonement theories. The question is asked, you know, why did Jesus have to go to the cross? Well, the first notion is the idea of substitution. That Jesus takes our place on the cross. And the idea goes that, you know, because of our sin, because of the bad things we do naturally as human beings, we deserve to die. And so Jesus dies in our place. That, that God allows him to die in our place. And that, lie, that idea goes even harder with some Christians who want to talk about penal substitution. In other words, that God, out of his wrathfulness against human sin, wants to punish human beings. Um, you know, that, that it's a, there is punishment deserved for being evil and being horrible to each other. So Jesus takes the punishment, hence the word penal, penal substitution. That's a, another idea. Now, that idea is not so popular with more progressive and liberal thinkers like me. <laughs> I, I tend to think that it, it's an idea that falls down on its own logic. Uh, if Jesus is God, why does God need to punish himself in order to then be merciful and loving towards you and me? It, it kind of doesn't make sense one famous evangelical who then became more of a liberal in this country Steve Chalk said um, that it, it it almost makes God sound a bit like a cosmic child abuser yeah that he would punish his son in order to deal with the sins of everybody else yeah? doesn't kind of make sense does it it'd be like <laughs> it'd be like Yasmin punishing Madda uh, for the sake of all the other children at the school. Yeah. Doesn't kind of compute. So, so uh, there's a third idea here, ransom theory. This is the theory that, that because we sin, we belong to the devil. Yeah, we are, we are the devil's children because we sin. This is the idea. 
Um, and that by going to the cross, Jesus gives his life as a ransom to the devil. He pays the devil with his life so that we can be freed by the devil. Wow, this is, again, problematic to liberal progressive Christians like me. For one thing, I'm not sure that I like the idea of a devil at all. I'm not sure that I can cope theologically with the idea that a loving God who creates the entire universe and pours out his life for us and loves us so much that he sends his son to live amongst us should also allow a devil in the world to go around taking us all back again. Again, it would be like Yasmin inviting an axe murderer to come and live in the house with her children. You wouldn't do that, would you, Yasmin? No. So why would God do that? Why would God allow a devil? If his God is all-powerful and can wink us into existence and out of existence with a thought, why would God allow a devil? So to me, it doesn't make much sense. But I need to teach it to you. Yeah? The theory is there. You are at liberty to believe it. All of this is a mystery. If you wish, you can believe that Jesus took your sins and he paid a price for them, either to God, penal substitution, or to the devil, ransom. Or you might want to think in different ways. About, for example, the idea of Jesus' death being a grand powerful and moral example to us first of all that Jesus shows us by dying for us that true kingdom life demands everything demands my soul my life my all as one of the hymns says so Jesus doesn't just stand in the marketplace and say, if you want to follow God, you've got to be prepared to give everything. He actually does it himself. It's a question of Jesus not saying, do what I say, but do what I do. Jesus shows us the limits and the length that he will go to to teach us what God is like and how we should live with each other. So what we're left with, and I am coming to an end here, and then there's space for questions, I promise. What we're left here is two competing but potentially complementary ideas about what it means to believe in God. I'm going to read these through. And then I'll try to unpack them a bit, because I know you'll be reading while I'm talking. So we might as well read and talk at the same time. Right. So let's read them through. So on the one hand, you've got the notion of personal faith. This is probably the one most people are most familiar with. Personal faith. Personal faith is uh, that our personal sin, sin that we've inherited through original sin, another old doctrine of the church, or things that we've done personally in our lives, creates a barrier between us and God. Yeah? We can't get past that barrier. And it's also a barrier between us and heaven. But sin stops us going to heaven, goes this, this form of belief. So we believe, which means we accept. We accept the intellectual proposition that we've been taught by others that Jesus dies to appease the wrath of God over our sin or buy us back from the devil so that then we can be presented pure and holy before God. We can move past the sin barrier and be welcomed into heaven. And as a result, we live holy lives in gratitude for that gift. And we want to share the good news about it. Yeah? And in this model of faith, a literal resurrection is proof of the power of that belief. 
And humanity can potentially, as Bishop John was saying this morning, be saved by believing this idea. So that is faith as the acceptance of an idea. Faith as the acceptance of a series of intellectual theological propositions. Are you with me? Are you following me here? Yeah? It means we, we, we trust what the church has taught us, what, what all those theologians over those thousands of years have tried to think about God. We trust that the result of all that is this neat intellectual set of, um, of ideas. We sin, sin stops us getting to God, Jesus pays the price for our sin, therefore we can go to heaven, therefore we tell others about it. But I want to suggest that there's a, a different, and for me I think more helpful, way of seeing faith. Not as a series of acceptance of some intellectual ideas, but rather an understanding that sin is something that's just endemic in the world. We see it all around us, don't we? It's a societal disease, the sin of hating and warring and fighting and grabbing and being selfish and greedy and all of that stuff. It's just, it's just there. It's, what, it's part of what it means to be human. By his death, Jesus shows us what happens when we reject God's laws and God's way. Jesus called his teachings the way. Early followers of Jesus weren't called Christians, they were called followers of the way. Did you know that? The word Christian was originally uh, an insult. It would be like calling somebody a Marxist because they follow Marx, yeah? Oh, these Christians, they're a pain, said the Romans, yeah? What, what the followers of Jesus called themselves were followers of the way. So Jesus shows us what happens to society when we reject his way of love and compassion and generosity and sacrifice. What happens is we end up pushing God out onto a hill outside our city wall. Yeah? Yeah? Jesus died in a lonely, lonely place on a hill outside the city. The city is where the people were. It's where the power was. It's where Pontius Pilate had his palace. It's where the Pharisees and the Sadducees sat. It's where the temple was. Yeah? It was where the marketplace was. It's where people lived. It's where the sin was. It's where the selfishness was. But Jesus, no, no, we push, we push him out. We don't want him in our city. We don't want to follow his way. So Jesus calls us to a different kind of faith than the accepting of a set of intellectual propositions about him. I believe he calls us to trust in the way. In God's way of living. Yeah? That has the potential to transform us. If we truly, as human beings, learn what it meant to love and care for each other, to look after the poorest in our communities and in our world, to no longer lift up sword against sword, yeah? to share the resources of the world fairly and distribute them to all rather than let them be held by a tiny minority of the very super uber rich in the world. If we really embraced the way of Jesus, the whole world, the many that Bishop John was talking about this morning, can be saved. It can be done. Huh? And so it becomes like a positive virus, doesn't it? If you follow the way of Jesus, like a good virus. Yeah, we spread our love around each other. Now, for those who are of a less uh, literal mind where Christianity is concerned, 
the question of resurrection must come up. You know, did Jesus really get up out of the grave? Well, for liberals and progressives like me, well, I'm not going to tackle the questions as to why that may or may not be true. All I want to say at this stage, although we can talk about it later if you wish, is that if we treat the resurrection as a metaphor rather than a literal event, a grand metaphor, then it can remind us that this idea of following Jesus' way can and must never die. That there is always hope for new life. That there is always hope that sin can be transformed yeah, and saved and, and, you know, uh, and, and redeemed. Yeah? That lives that have been destroyed by other people's sin or our own sin can be reborn. Yeah? Alcoholics can transform their lives and give up their alcohol. Yeah? Thieves can transform their lives and stop stealing. Yeah? Warriors can transform their lives and stop invading other people's countries. I think I've probably said enough. I wanted you to understand, particularly those of you uh, who want to be confirmed uh, on Easter evening, Easter, the, the, Saturday of, the Saturday before, just before Easter. We don't call it Easter Saturday. That's, I'm told that's the week after. <laughs> certain, certain members of more traditional um, churches get cross with me if I call it Easter Saturday. Um, <laughs> so it's the Saturday before Easter. The one between Good Friday and Easter. Yeah. Um, I wanted you to understand that... Um, I wanted you to understand the basic ideas of who God is that God is a mystery that we'll never truly fathom. I want you to be suspicious of anyone who tells you they know what God is like in detail. Or even more than that, they know what God thinks about any subject. Yeah? I want you to be suspicious, for example, of people who say to you, God hates queer people. Yeah? How do they know? God is a mystery. Huh? Or I want you to be suspicious of somebody who says God doesn't approve of women priests. Why? How do you know? Has God spoken to you? Huh? No, God is a mystery. You are like the dog that cannot fully understand what a human is like. I want you to understand the necessity of humility when we think about the things of God. Yeah? And to focus on what we do know, the core stuff, yeah? the love of God that he so obviously demonstrates to us by sending his son to show us what he's like. Tempered with his anger or at least concern for the sins of the world, but primarily rooted in love. Enough from me.